is Research Computing and Engineering, uh, Episode 1 with OpenMPI with George Basilica and Jeff Squires. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so starting off, exactly, most people listening to this are already familiar with research computing, but MPI, um, how would you describe MPI? MPI, it stands for the Message Passing Interface, and, and at its heart, it really is just that, you know, message passing. So you start up a bunch of uh, parallel processes together, and MPI is used to affect the inner process communication between them, right? So you, you're doing send and receive primitives and, and various other types of primitives, but it, at its heart, MPI is, you know, send this message from this process to that process, and the other process does the, the matching receive of it and so on. There are some, some uh, very handy things like collective operations as well. So you can do broadcasts and scatters and gathers and reductions and things like that. Um, but, but at its heart, it's really about communicating. So moving data and moving bytes from one process to another. It's rather amusing, actually. My wife laughs at me. She doesn't know why I have a job. She says, you know, all you're doing is moving bytes. How hard can that possibly be? Uh, but one of the, the, the challenging things about an MPI software implementation is that you really need to do it with very, very high performance. So, you know, you want to get the minimum latency and the maximum bandwidth and, and be very efficient in your memory usage and your I.O. resource usage and things like that. So all of these things get uh, factored into a very high quality MPI implementation so that we can deliver, you know, a, a very well performing middleware stack to the user who just really wants to compute and you know, compute their fast Fourier transforms or whatever the, the problem is that they're trying to solve in parallel. We just want to be the tool in the middle that, that just works and works very, very well for them. Probably a lot of people who are listening who have never written a parallel program before with MPI are probably wondering, communicating between systems, this is a solved problem. We have the Internet, right? I mean, why, why would we need to redo this again? But MPI actually has a concept of what you're sending, right? You say, like, I'm sending 24 doubles to processor 2, and it's very simple. There's no opening a socket or anything. And it's also network agnostic, right? There's, there's going to be multiple types of networks here where a computer can communicate. Exactly. These are, you know, I get this question a lot. Why, why don't I just use sockets? Why, why do I need to use this MPI thing? And you highlighted some of these things already. There's no connection management. You don't need to, what's the IP address over there? What port is it listening on? Who knows? Who cares? You know, what if it's not even a, a, a TCP-based network that you're on? What if you're on shared memory or InfiniBand or Quadrix or Cray or, or something like that? You just want to send your data. You just want to send it and have the other guy receive it. And how it gets there, it's irrelevant. You just want it to get there fast um, and be able to do, you know, discrete messages. That's another advantage here. So sockets are streams, right? You have to loop over reading until you get the entire set of data and then assign, a, you know, assign structure to it so that you can interpret the message. Whereas with MPI, you send a discrete message. I'll send you four doubles in an int, and you're going to receive four doubles in an int. You don't have to loop over you know, uh, polling to get all of the data and things like that. And not only that, is it, it's a discrete message, but it's also typed, just like we said. It's four doubles and an int. So you can send a struct. You can send actual data structures you know, down across MPI. And however it gets there, it doesn't really matter. You're just sending the data and receiving the data, and all the, the network magic that has to happen in the middle just happens automatically for you. That's kind of one of the points of, of uh, why MPI exists. And we should probably point out quickly, too, this is a distributed memory parallel. Every one of these processors has their own discrete memory space. If your code calls malloc and there's nothing keeping them from uh, saying which rank is actually calling malloc, everybody called malloc, and they all have their own little memory space. So if I have some data as a CPU and I'm trying to give it to another one, I have to explicitly send it to it, and they have to actually explicitly receive it also, correct? That is correct. Excellent point here. It is, it's all explicit parallelism. So you explicitly send and you explicitly really receive, and uh, you know, depending, you know, everything that you do, you have n copies 
of of your application running, right? And this is this is kind of one of the difficult things to wrap your head around for people who are new to parallel programming. That when you launch a parallel application, let's say you launch a a 32 way job or a 64 or 128 way job or something like that, one of the most common ways to do it, and there are other ways to do it, but one of the most common ways to do it is that you're really just launching 32 or 64 or 128 copies of the same executable. And so they're all running independently, but yet they know who they are. So a common pr- paradigm is I launch all 64 copies of this executable, and the very first thing they do is figure out who am I. Oh, I'm number seven out of 64, and so that I know that my portion of the work is over here. You know, I go to the index number seven, and, and that's my assigned work over there and things like that. So this is one of the difficult things in wrapping your head around parallel computing is that you have all these independent agents running simultaneously sometimes they synchronize sometimes they don't and so on so it's uh it's just a, a new way of thinking for those who are accustomed to programming in serial okay so open mpi um under what sort of licensing is it available under can a uh, commercial application include it and use it um or also what type of network types does it support some mpi libraries either support ethernet or in Finiband, um, you have to recompile to use a different network type. Um, is this an issue with OpenMPI or not? So you got you got two questions in there, and, and tell you what, I'll answer the the license part here, and I'll defer the other part there to George. Um, the license that we use in OpenMPI is BSD, and I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> this is not legal advice, uh, but it is our, my understanding that you know that's one of the most permissive licenses that's out there. So. You know, there's a lot of people out there who love GPL, and that's great, and GPL is good for a lot of different things. Um, but our goal in the OpenMPI community is to be as inclusive as possible. We want to include everybody. We want to include the users and the researchers and the academics and the vendors and, you know, the whole HPC community. And in order to do that, we had to get, you know, the least frightening license out there. And, and in our research and our lawyers told us that BSD is the one you want to go because, that will be, you know, the most inclusive and people can do whatever they want. And basically, again, my understanding is all they have to do is cite our copyrights. But it encourages people to to join us because they can literally do whatever they want with the source code to include re-releasing it under GPL if they wanted to. Um, but, you know, our goal was that anybody can distribute this source code for free. Um, there is no source license. It doesn't prohibit somebody from doing value add and reselling OpenMPI. But, you know, we wanted to set the license barrier as low as possible uh, to encourage uh, development and, and participation from all corners of the HPC community. So do you know of actual uh, software vendors right now with a commercial uh, application that's actually shipping with OpenMPI as a supported distributed memory parallel system? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to give a little bit of a weasel answer there. <laughs> um, well, actually, no. For, for Sun... Uh, OpenMPI is their MPI. Sun is uh, OpenMPI is cluster tools on uh, the Sun platforms, and so you know they have a whole team of engineers at Sun who work on OpenMPI and release it as part of their you know uh, op- high performance computing products and so on. Um, there are the, the weasel answer that I'm going to give is about ISVs who who use OpenMPI. There I, I do know of a couple of them. Um, I don't really want to say their names, and this is the weasel part mainly because I don't actually remember if they have released their products yet with OpenMPI or not. Um, and if they haven't released them yet, I, I certainly don't want to announce before they do. But uh, some of the reasons that OpenMPI is attractive for ISVs is that, you know, honestly, it's free. Um, it's pretty production quality. It, it generally just works. And, uh, you know, it takes a hunk out of a price um, for what the ISVs resell their their software for. They can actually, you know, reduce their price a little bit rather than having to pay someone else for uh, uh, an MPI license. So from that perspective, it can be pretty uh, attractive to the ISVs. Okay, so they would probably want multiple network type support. So what sorts of network types does OpenMPI support? Do you have to recompile it to enable a different network type? Or is it like an Ethernet-only library? Um, So we support as... uh Name a network, and I'm pretty sure we have support, or if we don't, we have it soon. Uh, right now, we support about 10 different networks. They are mostly targeted toward high-performance um, computing networks, so you will find InfiniBand, MiriNet, and so on. And uh, there are some other more um, 
um, exotic networks that we don't have right now, but the support will be there in the in the near future. Uh, the other interesting thing is that you don't have to recompile everything, so you don't have to have multiple MPI uh, for one per network and so on. Uh, in OpenMPI, everything is modular. Everything is included inside. It can build in one go. So once you have your um, MPI library, you can easily change from one network to another by just adding one parameter at the command uh, in the command line, and that's it. OpenMPI will do the magic to switch to the right network. If we don't specify, OpenMPI will try to find what's the best network available, what's the one that will give you the most performance, and we try to use that one. Now, you support a shared memory type of network, right? Um, of course. What if I have... What if I have two InfiniBand connected nodes and each of those nodes has like say four cores and I'm going to run across all eight cores in the system? Do the because I have to use ethernet between the two nodes, will the ranks inside one node still use ethernet or can they actually use multiple network types at a time? So they can use multiple n networks at the time. So inside the node, um, if you don't, let's suppose that the, you don't specify anything uh, by yourself. So you allow, you let OpenMPI figure out the, the magic. So internally in the node, we'll use shared memory because uh, as far as we know, this is the best uh, way to exchange messages between cores. I mean, between processes running in the same uh, processor. Uh, and then for external communication, then we figure out what's the best network. So it will be, from the user perspective, it will be completely transparent. And you can use as many networks as you want in same time. Uh, so if you have a, a very cheap solution, actually, to have a pretty good network, at least from bandwidth perspective, it's to buy for 50 bucks three network cards, one gig, and put them on your cluster. And with OpenMPI, that will be completely transparent. We we'll use all three of them. So when you look at the bandwidth that you get, instead of getting one gigabyte, you will get three. Oh, so the MPI library will actually bond for us with no administrator intervention? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so to clarify, one of the things that George said there is that, you know, we automatically pick the best network for you. That may actually be plural. We pick the best networks, networks. Yeah. for you. And we also do it on a per peer pair basis. So when we're looking at the best networks to connect, we're looking at from process A to process B. And that may be a different answer from process A to process C. For example, if A and B are on the same node, we're going to use shared memory. But if A and C are on different nodes, oh, well, let's use InfiniBand because I see an InfiniBand link here. Or, or no, I don't have InfiniBand, but I've got three network or three uh, Ethernet one gig cards. Well, let's use all of those and stripe across that automatically for you. So that is a really nice thing. You don't have to have kernel-level bonding. We'll do it up at the user level for you and just stripe large messages across it and round-robin short messages across them as well. How much control does the administrator have over this? Say a cluster has a um, an extra management network on it. Is there any type of um, cluster-wide configuration that can be made to prevent the management network from being used? Uh, yes. So... For those who know a little bit about uh, OpenMPI, we have a lot of parameters. So some of them can be used to restrict um, the usage of some of the networks. So in the in the case where you have three Ethernet, you can name the one that will, will never be used, or you can name the one that will always be used. So I can say, okay, ATH0, it's something that it's restrictive for, uh, let's say, management and NSF. So that's it. I uh, I let OpenMPI knows that he will never have to use this network, and uh, everything will happen internally. So there's a lot of uh, administrator level. Is there also there's also user level tunables that can be adjusted without recompiling. Absolutely. So you know this was actually one of our founding philosophies in OpenMPI that state of the art back when we created OpenMPI was that uh, okay you want to change one of the internal parameters of MPI now nah, you got to recompile or relink or, or do something like that. So a guiding philosophy to us from the very beginning of the code base has been you know instead of using a constant even if it's a compile time constant make it a runtime constant and make it a parameter that can be changed on the MPI run command line or changed on the, uh, you know, in a, if you 
supply a configuration file to OpenMPI or uh, an environment variable. There, there's a bunch of different ways you can change these parameters and so on. But uh, you know, every time that we have to make a decision, like should I use a uh, an, an eager protocol or a rendezvous protocol or, or a, you know, a million others, but eager versus rendezvous is a very easy one to discuss. Um, we made it a runtime parameter so that power users and system administrators can actually tweak these things. The average user, they're not going to care. They're never even going to use these parameters. They're just going to MPI run and, and the right magic will happen usually. Um, but for those are, you know, power users or administrators who want to set it up for, for the naive users, um, there's a lot of control that you can uh, exert over how OpenMPI runs itself internally. How many different parameters are actually modifiable in the current um, 1.2 <laughs> release of yeah, that, That's a really good question. <laughs> so uh, yeah. so uh, George and I were preparing for this interview yesterday, and we were actually trying to count. And uh, I'd say it's upward of 500. <laughs> wow, wow. So then oh. uh, between the 500 different ones and all the possible combinations, there must be you know, many thousands of different combinations that can oh, just be yeah. tweaked I, at runtime. The permutations are, are totally insane. And, and, and I actually want, this is a, a perfect opportunity to say that um, we have a lot of plans. So the, the current release series is uh, uh, 1.3. And I'm going to say that because 1.3 will be released today or Monday or something very, very soon from now. Um, we have a lot of plans for the 1.4 series. And, and one of them we consider is uh, a very critical usability thing. So the, the idea of being able to tweak the runtime parameters, it's wonderful. A lot of people use it. They love it, and they're, they love the ability that they don't have to recompile, and they can just change OpenMPI's behaviors. But it's also quite challenging. I mean, upward of 500 parameters, that's, that's a lot. How do you even know where to start? Um, so in 1.4, we're going to introduce a feature where we actually have a, a kind of a rating system for the parameters uh, from one to five. And five is uh, the casual user will want to use these. And uh, one will be, you know, a back-end developer will want to change these. And so our, our goal is to severely limit the number of parameters that you see when you just look for, hey, what parameters can I tweak? If I'm just a casual user, well, we'll only show you a dozen or two. These are the most important ones that you'll want to tweak. Well, let's say I'm, not, I'm, I'm a little more than a casual user. Oh, okay, well, here's here's 40 or 50 that you might want to tweak. Or I'm a power user. Well, you know what? Here's about 100 of them or so that you can tweak. So you can set what your experience level is and what your interest level is, and we'll show you that many parameters and let you choose and, and tweak and things like that. So we consider that to be a, a pretty important usability feature coming up in the 1.4 series. But um, for some of the more important, obvious ones that users and or system administrators might want to tweak, George, you want to you want to take this one? Oh, so uh, it's impossible to give a list. I mean, there are there are really m m many, and the they, how you use them it will depend on what exactly you plan to do. Um, so there are some for the processor affinity, some others for memory affinity. So if you really want to have control of on uh, how the processes are created and how they are bind. Uh, to a specific uh, resource like processor or memory, well, you can use them. Um, I know people who use them, but I can count them uh, with my one hand. Um, now, I, I use them on a regular basis. Uh, we have some other features that uh, allow the user to, um, uh, well, or parameters, allow the user to, to find out if the application is correct. So we can dump at the end, when the user call MPI finalize, we can dump... Um, um, a small status of the MPI library so the user can see if he had some uh, resource leaking or something like uh, he didn't destroy some communicators or uh, there were some communication um, in progress like uh, you know the non-blocking uh, sends or receive uh, which uh, is illegal from the MPI perspective and the user should uh, take care of them so that's uh, that's another another one uh, we have some that we take care of the um, uh, some of the network, like the one that re uh, require registration of the memory at the MPI uh, level, like MPI leave pinned, which will allow us to keep the memory pinned so we, we don't have to do it every time. Uh, these basically give us more performance on, uh, on these networks. 
And um, I think I will stop here because otherwise I will go on for uh, for hours. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a couple though that, that might be useful for for system administrator types. You might want to set, um, you know, like don't use the management level. You can actually set that at a global level so that all your users will will implicitly use that. So you know, don't use ETH zero because that's my my management network. You can also say, oh, uh, you know, make sure that when they MPI run, they're actually using the InfiniBand network or the uh, the Quadrix network or whatever network and so on. So you can set kind of defaults on a global basis so that, you know, the, the users who don't know or care just MPI run and get these values automatically. It can be good to just absolutely set these and, and ensure that that's the, the stuff that they do. Um, George mentioned a couple of the debugging parameters. Some of those are my personal favorites. One of the ones that I like is that um, we have a parameter that if you call MPI abort or if you trigger an MPI error for some reason, um, we'll actually delay for a little while before we actually kill the, the parallel job, which gives you the opportunity to attach a debugger and see what's happening in a live process rather than perhaps a core dump or something like that. Um, I think some of these you know, debugging level controls are actually uh, very important because uh, parallel programming is just pretty hard. And so tools that the MPI layer can give you to do this, um, particularly interaction with other development tools, I, I think that's a, a, a genuinely useful thing. So if a user using a cluster or an administrator wants to see what a current runtime value is set to, um, how, how do they find that out and how do they actually modify them? So uh, we, have a, we have a common a tool that allows the user to see everything inside, either everything or by categories. So um, the, the, we have different, uh, we call them components in OpenMPI, uh, some of them that are related to the network, some other related to the runtime, and so on. And uh, you can ask the specific uh, parameters of one of them. So the tool is called Umpi Info. And uh, and if you want to look for the for the parameter, uh, you can say minus minus param and then component and um, and framework uh, framework and component, um, or you can say simply all all, and that will basically give you the whole list of five hundred uh, uh, parameter that you can change. Yeah. And this is exactly the area where um, in the 1.4 series we're going to apply some of the, you know, what level am I? Oh, I'm a casual user. So instead of showing you all 500, you know, we'll only show you a dozen or two. So hmm. this is, there will be some neat uh, improvements in this area. And so users can set these values either at the um, command line with MPI run, some options, they're executable, or they can actually set environment variables. Uh or they can set uh, set a file which can be either set by the sysadmin in in the in the same directory where OpenMPI was installed, or the user can set it directly in her in their own uh, area in the dot OpenMPI directory. So there are some default files that OpenMPI OpenMPI will look for every time an MPI process is uh, started. So there are really many many ways to to set this uh, argument. Usually, yeah. So usually, if a user wants to set something that will be forever uh, on on a cluster, he will set it in his home area. I guess. Okay, not bad. So if they wanted to have it there all the time, they could make their own little config file and leave all the options in there. Okay, so that actually yeah. sounds really flexible compared to some systems I've used before, because there's been that compile, compile. So if a site, <laughs> if an administrator providing an MPI library started off with a Ethernet cluster, and then later on a faculty comes in or something and they add on InfiniBand. This is actually mm -hmm. really powerful because they can have one MPI library that will take advantage of the best network, and then on those different networks, depending which one they run on, they can modify all these little tweakable parameters on a exactly. per-component level. Exactly, and kind of the power there is they, they don't need to recompile. You know, oh, we you know we got another round of funding and we added InfiniBand to it. You can just re MPI run and you'll see the performance difference. Um, you know, of, <laughs> depending on your application, of course. But you know, if you're an application or bandwidth uh, hungry application, you know, you'll definitely see a, a market improvement. You know, moving to 10 gigabit Ethernet or or InfiniBand or or what have you. Nice, nice. Now, some users who have, have ran into problems on the cluster I run before. Um, this is a pretty common question. At a small scale, my application runs fine. When I increase the problem size, the application hangs. 
Now, I tried to explain to them Eager Rendezvous. Could you guys go into a little bit more depth exactly what Eager and Rendezvous are and why MPI send while blocking? It doesn't necessarily always block. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Eager and Rendezvous, it's some kind of um, uh, terms that we, we use in between to scare people. Uh, basically, for us, it makes a difference on how you want to send this data, right? So, of course, we can do something very easy. Every time you send a message, we take whatever was in the message, as big as it was, it doesn't matter, and send it to the remote node. And uh, to be honest, for a, for a good user, for a powerful user, the one who knows exactly what he's doing, I think that that's the best approach because that kind of user, the receive is already posted, now we know that not all of not all users do that so then we the mpi library try to be uh, libraries not only us because most of them do the same try to help them a, a little bit so instead of sending the whole message we send a little piece uh, with the marker, okay, with the MPI tag inside, and the remote node, we do the matching, and when this matching is done, which means the memory is ready to receive the message, we send the remaining of the of the message. So this is all the that's all the, the, that's the rendezvous protocol. Now, eager, it's everything that is smaller than this rendezvous, we send it in just one go, okay. So that's uh, that's the difference between eager and uh, and rendezvous. And, and this can really trip people up because yeah. it, exactly what you said in the beginning there, Brock, you know, maybe uh, when I was first running my application, I was just sending small messages and they were just sent eagerly. There was no implicit synchronization with the receiver, but then they, they increase their data size, they increase their problem size and, and they do MPI send with a larger message and underneath the covers, open MPI switches into a rendezvous protocol and suddenly that send is not going to complete until the receiver actually does a matching receive. And so they can see a little bit of unexplained uh, behavior here. But uh, in all fairness, uh, the MPI spec, there, there is a standard that we adhere to, right? The MPI mm -hmm. standard. Um, it, it says nothing about eager rendezvous or anything. These are, frankly, their, their implementation details, right? The okay. MPI standard actually d does not say, well, it says that MPI send may or may not block, and that's an implementation detail. But to... To send and expect that there is, a, you know, a receive buffer there, um, that is that is implicit and it's in its implementation defined about exactly what's going to happen. So we actually have license <laughs> from the spec to be able to affect this kind of behavior, and it's really it's a very difficult game to play, you know, because an MPI implementation has to tread a very fine line between resource consumption. And performance. You know, everybody always wants that super low latency and the super high bandwidth and so on, but they also want memory to run their real application. They don't want us to consume oodles and oodles of RAM, you know, until they're ready to use it, right? So if, if you send a one megabyte message and we send it eagerly, well, that means the receiver has to consume one megabyte of, of, of RAM because you have not posted a matching receive yet. We have to receive it and store that message somewhere until you do a matching receive and then copy the, the message into your target buffer. But we had to consume you know, all that extra memory um, uh, in the meantime. So a rendezvous protocol is kind of a resource-saving mechanism. That's, that's why we do it. That's what George was talking about. We try to give you a little help there. But the eager is trying to get it, get it sent, get it off that machine. It's safe to reuse that buffer so that the rank that's sent can keep computing, correct? Uh, that's correct. correct. We usually do it, you know, for small messages. Eager is usually applied to something small enough that, you know, if you if you send a, a 2K message, well, that's fine. We'll buffer it on the other side because it's small enough and it, and it doesn't really matter. But it does give you the best latency as well. So if a user finds themselves stuck in this kind of situation and they want to prove it to themselves that, you know, this is what's causing their problem, they can actually adjust these Eager cutoff points between the rendezvous and the eager, right? It's just another one of those tunable parameters they can just specify in the command line? Uh, yes, for most of the network, this uh, this is the case. Uh, and uh, so the thing is that that will not necessarily correct the application because if the application deadlock because, well, they don't follow the MPI uh, specs, like, uh, you know, the one of the biggest mistakes in uh, that user do in MPI is to to have both processes doing the MPI send followed by MPI receive. Um, so this 
as long as we are on the eager, this will work fine because send it's a kind of behave as a non-blocking. So you you send a message, you give it to the network, and then you go on the receive, and you will receive what uh, what's coming from the from the peer. Now, as soon as you go for large messages, this will not happen because the send will become blocking. And here we are. You will deadlock in your application. And of course, the first thing that people do is blame the MPI that there is a problem. <laughs> right. uh, when it, in it, fact, it's, no, it's a, it's, it's a worth application stating problem. That the MPI standard actually specifically outlaws this communication pattern. Yeah. It says if you do this, the MPI implementation is allowed to deadlock. Mm. And so don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now that now they have proof that. Uh, it's, it's their fault and not some fault elsewhere in right. the system. A, a fun little trick yeah. uh, that you can do to, to verify that your application is deadlock-free mm. is to change all of your, your uh, MPI sends to MPI S sends, sends. synchronous. Mm. And uh, what that does is it, it forces a synchronization with the other side that the send will not complete until the receive has been posted on the other side. Mm. And if you can change your application to completely use S sends instead of regular sends, then you know it's deadlock free. It's not going to be as performant as it was because you're, mm. you're doing all the synchronization, but you know, the, the S send pretty much forces a, a rendezvous protocol, and uh, you, know, you can use that to check for correctness of your application. Yeah. It, so it takes all the a, same a, arguments. You could just quickly do this with either like a preprocessor statement, but couldn't we also yeah. just set the, uh, the runtime parameter for the eager rendezvous limit to zero? What, that's everybody the to open MPI rendezvous? trick. No, that's yeah, the well, open, that's an open MPI, MPI trick. trick. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's a little difference between you know an MPI standard trick versus a, mm -hmm. a specific implementation trick. Trick. Ah, uh, I yeah. see. I see. Okay, so you're releasing 1.3 very soon. Um, there were some big changes in that. Uh, is there any cha major changes from that you'd like to point out, or do you want to run right in and describe what what you want to do in the future? Uh, let's talk about 1.3, because uh, we've, uh, <laughs> to be honest, we've been working on 1.3 for a very, very long time, <laughs> mm. um, but much longer than we intended, actually. But in, in fairness, when we started the 1.3 series, all the work on it, we said at the very beginning um, that this is going to be a feature-driven release. It's not going to be a schedule-driven release. We're going to mm. get all these features, and we're going to take as long as we're going to take. And unfortunately, that take as long as it's going to take took about a year and a half. Um, but <laughs> that's okay. We're, we're going to get it out in the next – the 1.4 series will very definitely be a schedule-driven release. Um, but in the 1.3 series, we have a lot of very cool stuff, actually. Um, there's a lot of open fabrics updates in there. So we did a, a bunch of stuff to optimize memory registration usage. Um, we did message coalescing. Actually, a fun little story about message coalescing. We uh, Message coalescing is the idea that um, you know, you're sending oodles and oodles of, of short messages – and eventually you back up the network so that you know you're you're sending faster than the network can send and so therefore you're you're backing up into software level queues instead of hardware level queues and the the trick that you can do there is you can actually collapse some of these short messages together into a single message when you see that it's sitting in a software queue oh that's exactly the same message well I'll just bump a counter and say oh we'll send two of these instead of one and therefore you can actually save you know some some bytes that are sent across the network when that message actually gets out on the wire um, that's a neat little optimization um, it has very little to do with real applications <laughs> yeah when um, I when I've looked see, at these things before they were more of a, yeah. a benchmarking trick it's, it's a oh, benchmarking yeah. <laughs> trick, and, and somebody got some cool papers out of it. And so we resisted doing this optimization for a long time um, because, it, it, frankly, it adds complexity down in the, you know, the deep voodoo you know, layers down in the, in the bowels of, of OpenMPI. And we're like, well, we just don't want to add that extra software engineering to do it. But we finally bowed to pressure. The sales guys uh, beat up on me and other guys saying, you need to have message coalescing. So... In the 1.3 series, we have message coalescing, so you can get really nice benchmarks, um, things out there. We also added support for iWarp, um, some, uh, some pretty cool flavors of 10 gigabit Ethernet NICs. Um, we added support for XRC, which is uh, Mellanox's proprietary protocol for uh, decreasing some, uh, some resource usage. So that, that's some pretty nice stuff. Um, we have full support for MPI 2.1 as well. So the MPI forum has gotten back together and and started uh, working on newer versions of the standard. And MPI 2.1 was kind of an important milestone that it fixed 
I don't know, somewhere in the order of 50 bugs or so in, in the spec itself. And so we support all of those fixes. A um, oh, cool. couple other pain points that, uh, you know, we, we love OpenMPI and we think it's great, but there certainly are some things that uh, can always stand to be improved. One of them that uh, we, uh, we definitely got uh, complaints about from users was what, then when an error occurred in an MPI application, you, you tended to see, uh, you know, 500 copies of the same error message. You got that same error message from every MPI process in the job. And so it just scrolled by. You're like, good grief, I only need to see that once. Why do I have pages and pages and pages of output? So we actually added a, a duplicate filter so that when, uh, you know, all 500 of your ranks die simultaneously, you'll only see that error message once and a little counter saying, oh, and I received it 499 times more as well. Um, some other cool stuff we did. We integrated with Valgrind. Um, there's uh, Valgrind, the memory checking debugger on, on Linux, has an API that you can actually integrate into your application, or in our case, into the middleware, that will do memory checking for you. And we can do some neat stuff saying, hey, you started a, a non-blocking send, but then you actually started changing the buffer. And that's, that's bad. Don't do that. Yeah, there's, there's actually been some trouble with that in the past, especially using um, networks like InfiniBand, right, where trying to use Valgrind would give you a bunch of crazy errors. Yeah, so InfiniBand and Open Fabrics in general and, and a couple other types of networks as well, they're OS bypass networks, right? So the memory may be coming from places that Valgrind is unaware of because the operating system honestly is is unaware of it or, or at least it comes in a, in a non-conventional kind of way. So we actually worked with Valgrind uh, its API and the Open Fabrics drivers in, in, in Open MPI and kind of smoothed all those things out and said, you know, for, for areas that Valgrind would traditionally say, oh, this is bad memory, we just use the API to say, nope, 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 it's actually, you know, we know a little better, so Valgrind, this memory is okay. So all those false positives kind of kind of go away. Um, so that's actually genuinely useful. So it sounds like there's a lot of neat stuff that I'm going to get to play with once I get 1.3, the stable installed. Um, in the future, what is slated for 1.4? So we continue some of the things that we did in the 1.3. Jeff didn't uh, mention them, like um, uh, we have support for 4Torrent, um, different kind of 4Torrent, and uh, we'll improve what we already have and we'll add more support. So... That's one. The other one is the the MPI thread multiple. So uh, we are kind of thread safe before, but uh, nobody had uh, nobody invested enough effort inside to make sure that everything is fine. So the one three in the one three we did that. So now we know that we are thread safe. Uh, so from correctness point of view, we are where we want it to be. But uh, we know that from the performance point of view, we lag a little bit behind. So that will be one of the major things that I uh, will be in the in the one dot four. Uh, MPI thread multiple with the best performance you can get, and we will add more support for uh, for torrent. Um, we have uh, some other plans to integrate more with tools, so to 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 help the user to debug their application, and not only to debug, but to un to understand exactly where the performance penalties are coming from and how to make their application uh, better. Then, of course, we have the MCA parameters that Jeff was talking about to, to show less uh, parameter to the user. Um, we, we plan to, to, to have the connectivity map. So right now, the problem with OpenMPI is that if, we, if you don't specify what kind of network you, you plan to use, and if there are multiple networks there, OpenMPI will do its stuff internally, but the user never know. And uh, that's something that we'd like to, to address. So to give a feature, to give a, a parameter to the user that say, you know, do whatever you think is best, but dump me the, the connection map. Yeah, the it's actually a, a surprisingly difficult feature to add and mm -hmm. why we haven't added it so far. Because uh, it's a distributed decision, right? You know, we said before, you know, what you use between A and B might be different between B and C and A and C. And so we kind of have to gather all of this data and print out a nice little matrix to the user. So it's yeah. a surprisingly difficult feature to add. That's why it hasn't been added yet. Yeah, yeah so I may you... actually want to add the, uh, the MPI thread multiple stuff. It's actually kind of handy um, going into the future looking towards like many core. Thread multiple allows better meshing of MPI processes with like a threaded style so you could have like one MPI rank per node and it would run 
and cores worth of threads. Uh huh. So this going into the future where we're getting many, many cores on a system, we may not want to duplicate memory so much with the discrete memory spaces, or we may want to avoid the amount of communication going on and actually mm -hmm. allow uh, use a threading library instead. And that should make that yeah, a lot I should, simpler. I should give a, uh, an important caveat to our thread multiple support. You know, so our, our point to point operations are, are thread safe, or we're pretty sure they're thread safe. We'll see what happens when people start running real apps on them. Yeah. Um, but uh, a lot of the support functions are not thread safe yet. So that's going to take a lot of time and effort to do. But you can do your MPI sends and receives and tests and waits and things like that. And those should all be, be thread safe. But doing all the support functions, those are going to require some more work from us. Yeah, like the attributes and, um, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this has been really good. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you guys. Um, if you could be dictator for a day of the MPI forum, what major changes or any even even a minor change, something that bugs you, would you want to make to the <laughs> MPI spec? Hey, George, why don't you take this one first? Why me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, George, what George is alluding to, both of us are actually on the MPI forum, right? So George <laughs> represents the University of Tennessee, and, and I represent Cisco. And, and both of us actually have multiple proposals up in front of the forum already, you know, of various different flavors, some big things, some little things, and so on. And so uh, we're not dictators for a day, but we do have our own little pet peeve projects that, uh, that we want to answer, you know, and get, get in there. So, for example... You know, my I think the biggest proposal that I have in front right now is a a better ability to layer MPI underneath different languages. So you know, it's cool that we have C, C plus plus, and Fortran bindings, but what about those guys who want to do Python? Um, and I've actually even heard people who want to do Ruby, um, MATLAB, you know, various other languages that they just want to use MPI as the underpinnings for. I, I think we as a standard can actually do a better job of being able to support that kind of model. George. Well, so Jeff was par partially right because, uh, yes, I have my pet project, but uh, <laughs> it, it's not what I would do if I was a uh, dictator of the MPI. Actually, I think that I would try to slash out some some of the things. Really? Um, yes, I think that it's uh, – the problem with MPI is that it gives so many – I mean, we have a lot of functions, and they are all useful for some for some people. Uh, but when you when you try to learn something new, and you look there and you see, wow, man, there are four hundred different functions that a, each one of them do something different. I think it's a little bit scaring for for people. And uh, on the other side, I think that if we decrease this the the number of this function, we as implementers can focus on what really matter. You know. Be scalable. Do give the best performance out of the cluster, and then some other people can r write libraries on top of it that will give to the final user the the extension that he's uh, he's looking for. So it's something that I, I I don't know if I would like to enforce, but I think that it's um, it, it might be an interesting idea to look at tiny MPI. Tiny well, MPI. not necessarily tiny, but keep everything related to communication and so on inside and then move everything else in extensions to to MPI. So take MPI on the biggest loser is what you're saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nice pop culture reference there, Jeff. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, actually, Jeff, we're going to wind up here in a little bit, but there was something you and I had talked about at SC this year that was actually quite interesting to me given that the uh, the next show after this is going to be Joshua Anderson from the Whom project, which is a CUDA, which for you guys who don't know what CUDA is, it's NVIDIA's graphics card implementation um, for actually putting scientific applications on a graphics card. And there was some discussion about how can we better write distributed memory parallel programs that are utilizing graphics cards. And we actually wanted to, we were talking about mixing MPI in with that. Now, what kind of ideas do you have for doing that? Well, there's there's uh, some interesting ideas going on there. And the, the very first thing I want to say is that, you know, none of this is going to be the answer. But I think that MPI has at least a, a small role to play in, um, you know, the, the GPU and hardware acceleration 
of mathematical operations. And there's there's at least two different ways to to do this. And I, I say this, and this is came up at supercomputing because uh, a gentleman from the the Nvidia booth came up to me and said, "Hey." Uh, you know, I actually have some customers doing MPI programs and, and doing GPU kinds of things with it. I want to be able to MPI send and receive directly from GPU memory because it's, it's separate than, than the main memory. Um, and, uh, you know, we can do some forms of sending and receiving, but we can't do direct forms where I, I actually RDMA directly the message uh, to and from the GPU memory. Can we figure out how to fix this problem? So that's, that's one thing that we need to fix uh, on tiny some of these MPI? complicated network stacks. I'm sorry? Tiny MPI? Uh, yes, with tiny yeah. MPI. Right? <laughs> 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 um, but the other one that uh, – so we, you know, I was talking to this guy from NVIDIA, and we said, you know, well, what about MPI has this function called MPI reduce, where MPI will perform a, you know, a math- mathematical reduction function for you. So you know, every one of your MPI processes has uh, – you know, uh, 2,000 double precision numbers that are part of a vector. If I want to do a global sum across that vector, this is an intrinsic operation uh, for MPI that'll do the communication and computation all in kind of one step for you and then give you the answer. But this kind of operation is is very natural to farm back onto some kind of hardware acceleration, be it GPU or, or otherwise. And so um, one of the things that we did when we, wa- we walked away from supercomputing this year saying, yeah, that's a very intriguing idea. We should investigate being able to have MPI be able to take advantage of hardware acceleration. Now, in addition to that, so that's a parallel operation, right? The, the reduction operation, you know, a global sum across all my processes, you know, or a global uh, product or, or whatever the operation is. There, in, the, in an upcoming version of the MPI standard, there's a proposal from a, a guy by the name of Torsten Hoffler from the uh, University of Indiana who has um, a proposal for a new function that allows you to do a serial reduction. So I'm just in one process. Give me the, the global sum of this, this vector right here. So I don't have to use the MPI mechanisms for communication, but I do want to use the MPI mechanisms for computation. And this seems like a very natural way to hide some of the GPU complexity behind it. You've got people who already are familiar with MPI. If we can just make MPI reduce be a little bit faster, you know, because we're farming it out onto accelerator hardware, or we can give you this new, you know, local reduction function that, you know, not, not, a, not a communication thing, but just hide some of the CUDA or OpenCL, which is another programming language for hardware acceleration kinds of things. Hide that behind there so they don't have to learn a new API, but still give them the power of that acceleration. You know, that could be pretty neat. And so we just kind of completed phase one of that in the open MPI code base. We added the infrastructure to be able to have plugins or components for CUDA and OpenCL and MMX and SSE and things like that. And so now the next step is, uh, you know, to actually write some of these plugins that, uh, you know, if you've got a GPU, we'll just automatically use it. Very much in the, in the same light that George was talking about before, that OpenMPI will automatically choose the best network by the same token. We'll say, oh, you have a GPU? Well, I'll just load up that plug-in, and anytime you call an MPI reduce, I'll, I'll farm it back there. Actually, that, that brings up a good point that there's an opportunity for a lot of research here because those accelerators are hanging off of a bus that, uh, you know, may be fast, maybe not, um, and we're seeing this sometimes with the GPUs. So it'd actually be kind of nice if you could do that serial reduce and it would, mag- it would just magically take advantage of uh, you know, 128-bit SSE or 64-bit SSE or a GPU if your data is large enough to move across that bus, utilize the massive horsepower and the massive memory bandwidth and move it back and actually be efficient. So that's actually a yeah, really that, that interesting is idea. I, hmm. I, I lost over completely. The decision about whether you're going to farm it back to the GPU or not, it might be, well... You know, we're only going to do this when, uh, you know, it's more than 100 doubles or something like that. Or the hardware is not even capable of doing double precision. It can only do floating point precision. So there's actually a decision you have to make first about, am I going to farm it back onto the hardware or am I just going to do it on the main CPU? And this is kind of the power of the OpenMPI project. So, you know, I'm from industry. I'm from Cisco. George is from the University of Tennessee. He's from academia. You know, we've got to have this, the yin and the yang of the project that. I went and did the infrastructure part of this project, and now I'm kind of handing it off to some of the academics to say, all right, now you guys, you know, come up with this. How how do we do this? I don't know the right answer. We need to experiment. We need to research and figure out the best way to do it. And the universities and the academics are are much better suited to doing that than than the vendors. And that's one of the things that makes the OpenMPI project work so well. 
<laughs> There'll be another PhD out there thanks to uh, this idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's part of the reason that, you know, I, I said back at the beginning here that, you know, the Open MPI project, we really want to engage everybody. You know, there's a lot of people with smart ideas out there. And, uh, you know, whether you're a, a grad student with just a cool new idea for an algorithm or something like that, we, we want to talk to you and we want you to have your stuff be part of Open MPI. That's why we're a community. That's why we work together. Oh, cool. That, that, that's really great. So where, where can uh, the Open MPI project be found and how can actually people get involved? So the, our, our central website is uh, open-mpi.org. And uh, if you go there, probably the best way to get involved is to just uh, start looking at our mailing list, join our mailing list, join the conversation, ask questions and things like that. And, uh, you know, if you actually want to start contributing, there actually is an, an intellectual property agreement you have to sign uh, because we're trying to do this properly, right? We don't want to just take code and, and, and hope that, you know, we can redistribute it under BSD license. There actually is a form that you have to sign. And the form actually is the Apache Software Foundation form. We... Uh, we very definitely benefited from that project's work there. We, we just changed Apache to OpenMPI, and it basically you know, gives us the right to redistribute things under, under the BSD license. Again, same disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. But you know, for anyone who contributes code back to OpenMPI, we do require that that uh, form is signed. Now, <laughs> I don't want to say that to be scary, but it is one of those necessary legal things here. But we love having more people involved, and it usually starts with just a conversation or or somebody saying, hey, you know, I've got, a, I've got a wacky idea. And, you know, we start talking and, and, and fun and interesting things happen from there. Okay, cool. Well, guys, thanks for uh, taking some time out to talk mm -hmm. with me. Thank you for being the uh, inaugural show of Research Computing and Engineering. And I hope to see you guys around. I tend to be at SC every year and see you guys there too. So thanks again for being on. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. This was great. We appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks a lot.